everyone. It's nice to see, well, or not to see everyone today, but thanks for joining us. I'm Rachel Nelson, Director of UC Santa Cruz Institute of the Arts and Sciences, and I want to welcome you to Abolition Then and Now with Robin D.G. Kelly and Isaac Julian. This event is part of the Visualizing Abolition series, organized in collaboration with Gina Dent and bringing artists, scholars, activists, and others together around the creative charge of imagining a world beyond prisons. The event today is a collaboration with the McAvoy Foundation of the Arts, and it's been a pleasure to work with Amy Owen, Susan Miller, and everyone at the foundation. We thank two and always Nyan McAvoy. This collaboration came about because of the confluences and shared concerns the McAvoy Foundation's exhibition of Isaac Julian's Lessons of the Hour, the stunning 10 screen video installation and poetic meditation on the life and legacy of abolitionist Frederick Douglass, and the exhibition Barring Freedom at San Jose Museum of Art I've curated with my comrade Alexandra Moore. Barring Freedom brings together artists based in the United States who creatively engage the racist histories and presence of policing and prisons. Unfortunately, due to the surging pandemic, both exhibitions are temporarily closed, but we are optimistic they will be back open in a matter of weeks. Until then, we're pleased to be able to offer this online programming, which includes today the premiere of a new music video by Nicholas Payton, Freedom Is No Fear, as part of our Music for Abolition series, curated by Terry Lynn Carrington. Stay tuned at the end for that. And do visit barringfreedom.org for event archives, music for abolition videos, and other resources. For Gina and I, as we were planning Visualizing Abolition, we were incredibly interested in thinking between Isaac Julian's immersive work at the McAvoy Foundation and the work of artists like Sanford Biggers, Sonia Clark, Sadie Burnett, Shannon McCormick, and Keith Calhoun in Barring Freedom. What was compelling for us is in how between these exhibition and artworks, what emerges is an image of an ongoing struggle between both the mental and physical apparatuses of, slave, of racial oppression in this country that spans from the 19th century today, and a clear articulation of the essential and fundamental roles art, imagery, and aesthetics have in current struggles. We wanted to think more about the implications and the importance of creative approaches to the movement for abolition. And who could talk better about this than Robin D.G. Kelly and Isaac Julian, both of whom not only can speak to history, but can also talk about their own work as part of this creative and historic struggle. Neither need much of an introduction, of course. Robin D.G. Kelly is professor in the Department of African American Studies at UCLA, and his research has explored the history of social movements in the United States, constructions of race, music, visual culture, and more. This summer, I reread Robin's wonderful book, Freedom Dream, which traces the history of the African diaspora and social movements in the US and chronicles within those movements, vibrant dreams for a more just world. Though the book came out first years ago, amid the uprisings this summer, I was struck again by how important Robin's narration of history in the United States is. In his deft writing, movements, music, and art work together to as and assemble into a world not defined by oppression, but by the imaginative struggle for freedom. And Robin in his writing for professional journals as well as general publications, including the Journal of, Afri of American History, the New York Times, The Crisis, The Nation, Counterpunch and, Punch, and more, continues to take part in creatively making this world. British artist and filmmaker Isaac Julian is also a distinguished professor of the arts at UC Santa Cruz. Born in London, Julian was a founding member of the San Profo film, uh, film and Video Collective formed to expose the racialized unconscious of British society in the Thatcher years, and sub subsequently of normal films established to produce queer cinema in a UK context. Julian is represented in museum, museums and private collections throughout the world, including the Museum of Modern Art, New York, Tate, London, Central Pompidou, Paris, and many others. He's had an immense influence and it's a deep pleasure to have Isaac at UC Santa Cruz. And I thank him and Robin for joining us today. I also thank Gina Dent for again, moderating the conversation. It's been a total pleasure working with Gina on these projects and with her deep history of abolition research and activism, I appreciate all she brings to the conversations. Bring you all in. Thanks for coming. Hi. Oh, thank you, Rachel. And thanks everyone for joining. We know it's midday, it's a little bit different for our schedule, but we're happy you're here. And this is going to be such an amazing conversation. First of all, welcome to Robin and Isaac. Uh, I know we've known each other for a very long time now. We won't tell anyone how long, uh, but it's lovely to get to see you on screen since we haven't been able to be together in person for a very long time also. 
So welcome and let's get going today. I, we couldn't really have thought of a better team to help us to think about what we're calling the abolitionist present. This present really relies on being able to see abolition also in our past. Not only the abolition of slavery, but also to think prison abolition through the grammar provided by an intense scrutiny of how we've absorbed history. And so I'd really love to talk to both of you about these themes and also to focus on lessons of the hour and to have a wide ranging conversation about where we are now, how we've gotten here and how we could reinterpret our past toward a different future. So I'd like to start with you, Robin. Uh, you've been writing about freedom dreams for a long time. You've helped so many of us to reframe our understanding of the past toward a usable future. And I would love to hear you talk about what's happening now in terms of this uh, reinvigorated interest in Du Bois, this deep taking up of his legacy, and also to talk about what it might mean for this moment. Right, thank you, Gina. Um, first, I'm just really honored to be here. I I'm so tired of Zoom, I can't even tell you, but this is one of the exceptions where I'm, I'm, I'm so excited, I'm, I'm nervous. Um, so just to go back, I know part of what you, you know, wanted me to talk about is sort of what does it mean to revisit uh, Douglas's life and work, uh, you know, at this moment. And it's interesting, the question is so funny to me because I feel like I've, my whole life, we've been revisiting Frederick Douglass, my entire life, you know, um, I'm supposed to be doing this other event after this, uh, talking about uh, Yoga Tagoyal's new book, Runaway Genres, Global Afterlives of Slavery. And again, Frederick Douglass is a kind of main theme throughout because his narrative is in some ways the foundation for the kind of neo-slave uh, narratives that have really kind of taken up, been taken up by historical fiction, accounts of human trafficking, you know, even in the global South. Um, now in Freedom Dreams, I don't write about Douglas, but there are a couple of things that, that are implied. One is, you know, thinking about abolition as not the end goal. Uh, that abolition is, is not about ending chattel slavery, that was never the end game, but really a process, this kind of fluid ongoing critique of every form of oppression. And um, I was reminded uh, that in, my book, Your Mama's Dysfunctional, Before Freedom Dreams, I quote um, the Congress of African uh, Peoples, the uh, women's group, and they adopted the slogan, which actually comes from Lenin's essays, <laughs> Soviet Power and the Status of Women, when they say they, they're calling for the abolition of every possibility of oppression and exploitation. Uh, and so, I, you know, in Freedom Dreams, I'm thinking about, you know, in terms of prison abolition, just the way that in discussing surrealism, for example, that abolition is also about, you know, the psyche, metaphysical forms of abolition, epistemic abolition, poetry as emancipation of language. So in, in other words, Douglas, given his long life, always reminds us that abolition is this ongoing process, this constant interrogation, this kind of revelation of, of you know, recognizing new forms of oppression that we're complicit in and then we have to fight those. And what's interesting, this last thing to say about Douglas is that there's a kind of countervailing tendency, you know, Douglas proves in his life that he could change his mind about strategies of abolition, where he moves from say the Garrisonian rejection of the constitution uh, as, as pro-slavery to like the adoption of the constitution as anti-slavery uh, later. Uh, his, ish, his position on the emancipation of women, despite his own practice, reflects these certain contradictions. You know, the, the opening scene in, um, in Lessons of the Hour is a, a lynch body. You just see the feet. And this is a very powerful image to remind us that he's continuing to fight for abolition throughout his life and recognizing these oppressions. And, and, and finally, you know, Douglas, you know, it, on the, on the other hand, opposed the use of slavery to describe any and all conditions of oppression 
and dependency. In other words, he wasn't really into slavery as the analogy for everything. And this is why he had this very clear definition of chattel slavery as a system in which one person claims to have property right over another, where masters exercise absolute power. We enslaved are protected by no, no laws, uh, you know, and then where the master um, is to, you know, the, the master claims power over the body and soul of the enslaved, denied not just rights of, of, of body, but rights of mind and soul, the, the, the freedom to pursue education, religion. And so there's a way in which the, the tendency to kind of claim that everything is, is slavery as a way to be abolitionist. That's a critique I think that, that um, going back to um, Douglas sort of brings to bear in some ways. Thank you so much. And I, I really want us to follow up on this because I think one of the challenges for our series also and for this moment is, is to think through these analogies, to understand them as analogies, understand that analogies are also false uh, and that we need to actually struggle in new ways, but try to learn from the past. And I think Isaac, this is a perfect moment to bring you in because your beautiful work, and, I, and I'm also thinking back to all the years I've, I've seen your work, um, listening to references to some Kofa now um, takes me way back, but um, I love to have you just take us through a little bit of your inspiration for Lessons of the Hour. Uh, and then um, I know we're lucky enough to have you have some slides ready for us to share. So I'd love for us to do that as well. Yes, I think, you know, in a way, um, you know, just listening to um, Robin and really yourselves and really thinking about, in a way, first of all, the pivotal role that, um, you know, African-American culture has had for the diaspora. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a way in which, you know, when we think about the trajectories um, of that diaspora, and in a way, I think the sort of work really of the ways in which, um, even if we look at the questions of the trajectory of um, slavery and its kind of um, retribution um, that it's had on lives, for me, um, is really, Oddly enough, um, you know, someone who comes from born in center of a particular empire, <laughs> there's a way in which, you know, um, at the center of it, the kind of invisibility of these questions are so striking. They're so striking. And so um, in a way um, with Douglas, um, who I first came across really through the work of um, Skip Gates um, while I was at Harvard, um, and then in a way being reintroduced to him um, through the commission. I mean, for me, it was very much pivotal to um, really these questions, which are in a sense completely repressed um, in terms of questions of modernity and, you know, being born, as I said, the heart of the empire, then there's a way in which I think um, the ghosts of Douglas, um, you know, and the, his relationship to both Scottish history and in a way to um, the, the indebtedness, I think, um, that we have um, in relationship to his work, um, you know, for me was one of the sort of inspirations for trying to make the work. But of course, he's such an incredibly large figure. Um, of course, I had to work out how would one try to make a work um, that would try to um, go through these trajectories, you know, and it was really through the help of working with um, Douglas scholars. Um, I don't really see myself as a, as, as a Douglas scholar. I see myself as an artist, but, you know, it was really that help, um, that pivotal help, which um, gave me the sort of materiality um, to create um, the work, you know, and so working through those kind of forms um, of the archive, of an archive which has an archival consciousness and how one can use that as a mode of trying to um, create um, the sort of um, visual language um, um, to bring Douglas alive into the 21st century, I mean, was, um, you know, an inspiration. And, th and those inspirations obviously come from his words, you know, um, and of course, the many 
amazing things that he did. So, and I think it was precisely then, you know, what happened in Scotland um, and that history, which in a way um, opens up so many questions, I think, for thinking about Douglas and, you know, what he did, um, of course, um, here in America, you know, and so in a way, those questions of abolitionism, you know, for me, it was how can I bring those kind of alive to the forefront um, in some way or fashion. Could you, before we start the slideshow, could you just say a few words about what visual language, what visual history of Douglas you felt you had to confront? What were you encountering when you entered the project? Well, I think the, th the main thing is, is that in a way, for me, you know, um, in the kind of, if you like, this kind of scholarly work that had been done on Douglas, you know, was so interesting and I think so important, you know, where the challenge, you know, for the kind of visual artists or um, imaging is really, you know, how does he live and breathe? How does he walk? How does he, you know, what, you know, what are his relationship to horses and to animals? You know, those kinds of questions. And um, I think sort of, you know, and I think all of those questions also bear very strongly on the performance and the information that one would relay to performance and to actors. And all of these things were incredibly important. But I think, you know, there were a few clues which, um, you know, really, um, galvanized one in relationship to um, into Douglas for us. And I think um, those were his relationship to literature, to writing, the kind of Shakespearean trajectory in his works. Um, and then also I think there was really his passion for art, you know, and his relationship to technology and photography in particular. I mean, those two things were so pivotal um, you know, that he would write, uh, you know, philosophize about photography 75, you know, 70 years before Benjamin, Walter Benjamin, you know, and the fact that that is something which, if you like, African scholars have been at the forefront of foregrounding, you know, but I mean, I don't think these are taught that much in art historical scenarios. And so for me, it was precisely those two parts which you know, that felt like a kind of injustice, <laughs> you know, so how can one attempt a kind of visualization and a translation of those ideas into um, a sort of contemporary form? Beautiful. Thank you. Well, would you like to sh start sharing? I think we're ready. <laughs> so, how I did nothing without a demand. I mean, this was a kind of amazing poster project, which um, was initiated by the foundation uh, at McAvoy and us. And um, these amazing quotes were so central to our whole idea of really, I think, linking um, to the contemporary demands, um, which were being announced on the streets you know, in 2020, which echoed this demand that Douglas made, you know, in the 19th century, you know, um, the prophetic aspect that Douglas knew this kind of idea was a pivotal idea for empowerment. And if we move to the next slide. In this, we'll have um, his whole discussion around photography and the way in which photography precisely is that demand in terms of embodying the apparatus and offering it in the way that Douglas did. He knew that he needed to change the rules of representation um, and it would be through the apparatus of photography that this enlightenment would happen. Pictures, like songs, should be left to make their own way into the world. All they can reasonably ask of us is that we place them on the wall in the best possible light. And for the rest, 
allow them to speak for themselves. I rightly viewed, I mean, the whole soul of man is a sort of picture gallery, grand panorama, in which the great facts of the universe and tracing things of time and things of eternity are painted. The love of pictures stands first among our passional inclinations and is among the last to forsake us in our pilgrimage here. It is said that the best gifts are the most abused. This, among the rest, conscience itself is misdirected, shocked by delightful sounds, beautiful colors, and graceful movements. It sleeps amid the 10,000 agonies of war and slavery. So, of course, you know, in that extract, you get this sort of idea of the scenography of the installation. And of course, it's through the choreography of Douglas's speech um, that we're unable to follow, um, you know, this argument and how it links, of course, um, to these other questions, modernity, that the apparatus of photography, in some senses, for him, is connected to the liberation from um, slavery as an apparatus and system. And so if we could go to the next slide. Isaac, could I pause you for one second also? Yes. Um, could you say something about, from your point of view, the notion of pictures speaking for themselves? Yes, I mean, I think there's a way in which, you know, um, you know, it's amazing, I think, that you have sort of Douglas, you know, making this sort of assertion about art and photography and this kind of sensitivity to um, representation. Um, and of course, I mean, the whole idea of pictures um, talking for themselves is this kind of utopian role that art can play in relationship to the question um, of Douglas in terms of self-imaging, you know? And so, I mean, I would say that the quest in relationship to one's own work begins with that question of self-imaging and I think the question of that is a crucial importance to Douglas in terms of how he wants to undo the representational oppression um, that African-Americans um, and Black people are facing at this particular time. The, you know, crude and objectionable and crushing stereotypical representations which are marked and he wants to unmark you know, and so, um, of course, you know, in a way, you could say there's a kind of interpolation of different forms in the exhibition between both photography and the moving image. And, um, and what I've tried to do, for example, um, in the image um, that we see here of the gallery is to re-articulate this question um, through the sort of genres of painting and photography, but to, in a way, highlight perhaps the kind of gendered role uh, in relationship to Douglas, because of course he was the most photographed um, person of the 19th century, um, more, more so than Lincoln. But of course, you know, Anna Murray Douglas, his wife, you know, is seldom represented. So I wanted to sort of, you know, in a way, play with that, interrupt that, and to foreground, you know, her presence. But this question between photography and its trajectory. Um, from the Dura type to the tin type, um, to the way that it sort of creates this liberation where he says that every household can now have access to a medium that was once only fit in relationship to, um, you know, um, kings and queens. You know, he's really talking about the liberating role of photography um, and the fact that um, through its means of um, mass production, you know, that one could own one's image. And I think that was a crucial step towards an abolitionist um, sort of um, role, you know, which would undo particular pathos 
um, at that moment. Thank you. And if we could go to the next slide. So here we have, you know, the North Star image, um, which is him and Anna Mary Douglas seated in a carriage. North Star, of course, is the um, abolitionist newspaper, which the family made. But it's also a link in this image to the role of the to the role of the railroad, underground railroad. You know, they're on a train, of course, looking as it were north, so to speak. <laughs> Um, in a form of trepidation, um, and of course, on the right hand side, there's an image of um, Helen, um, his second wife, his white wife, who, um, that, which was very controversial, but she was someone who had a very strong abolitionist background as well. Um, and then there are some tin types, which one can't quite see, but of course, that just connects to the directory of um, the role of these different technologies. Um, which are hinted at in the exhibition. If we go to the next slide, please. And here we have the close-up here um, of North Star. Um, and what I've tried to do is to foreground Annie Mara Douglas um, and to really reposition her role in this narrative. Um, and of course, if we read David Blight's um, amazing book, The Prophet of Freedom, you know, there's a way in which Anna Mary Douglas's role I think is, um, you know, I think for, for me is is incredibly important, you know, and there are ways in which um, I think that, you know, there's a possible reevaluation um, of her role, I, I would like to argue. If we go to the next slide, please. And here we have the tintype portraits. Um, of course, you know, this is Ray Fairon as Frederick Douglass. <laughs> this is not Douglass himself, but, <laughs> but it really just stems to the point of the sort of um, visual topography and architectural kind of framings of the work and, um, and the image on um, the right, um, which is called Serenade, has um, J.P. Ball, who was um, important um, African-American photographer, had an amazing daguerreotype studio. Um, I luckily just purchased Deborah Willis's book. It cost me $700, <laughs> you know, because um, she's actually one of the only scholars um, in photography that has really given the kind of historical account um, of J.P. Ball um, and given that critical attention. Um, her book that she wrote 20 years ago. Um, and, um, the, and the woman on the left um, is um, J.P. Ball's um, wife, supposedly, in my construction. <laughs> if you can go to the next slide, please. And here we have the sort of, um, you know, more scenographic representation of the installation at McAvoy. And you'll see we have um, taken into account social distancing <laughs> in seating arrangements, but um, more importantly, you know, you can see the salon hang of the screens. And this was really just a sort of um, nod to the salon hang, um, which have been a pictorial um, sort of um, way in which um, paintings would have been hung um, during Douglas's time in a gallery, which you can see today in the Royal Academy, for example. And of course, we see the images here of J.P. Ball's studio, an image of Douglas, lecturing to an audience um, in Scotland and an archival image um, of a tin type, which is in process. Um, and this question of sonography of the way in which you have this montage of attractions or the use of parallel montage to try to create a way of retelling Douglas's um, sort of history and, and, um, and putting into play the questions around time, um, which one can achieve with multiple screen editing, um, which is another sort of, if you like, theme of the work. If you go to the next slide, please. And I think here we have um, one of the speeches, which I thought was one of the really fundamental speeches. Um, and we have here a single screen version of the work, um, What to Slave is the 4th of July. And in that speech, I think we have um, in this single screen version, 
um, the real, I think, you know, damning critique, which still resonates, I think, so strongly today in terms of the unanswered questions and unfinished business around questions of abolition. Um, and if you like, the way in which it haunts the present still. So if you could play this clip, that'd be wonderful. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the distance between this platform and the slave plantation from which I escaped is considerable. And the difficulties to be overcome in getting from the latter to the former are by no means slight. That I am here today, to me, is a matter of astonishment as well as of gratitude. The American slave trade is a terrible reality. I was born amid such hellish sights and scenes. As a child, my soul was often pierced with a sense of its horrors. I lived on Philpot Street, Fells Point, Baltimore. And I've watched from the wharves, the slave ships in the basin anchored from the shore. This cargo full of human flesh, waiting for favorable winds to waft it down the Chesapeake. And in the still darkness of midnight, I have often been aroused by the dead heavy footsteps and the piteous cries of the chain gangs that passed our door. What? To the American slave is your fourth of July. I answer. A day that reveals to him more than all the other days in the year the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To him, Celebration is a sham. He boasted liberty, an unholy license. Your nation's greatness, swelling vanity. Your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless. Your denunciation of tyrants, brass-fronted impudence. Your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery. Prayers and your hymns, your sermons and your thanksgivings, with all your religious parade and solemnity, are to him mere bombast. Fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy. A thin veil to cover up crimes, which would disgrace a nation of savages. There is not a nation on earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody and all the people in these United States in this very hour.
Thank you. Yes, I mean, you've just seen the sort of single screen um, aspect of that work. And in a way, um, of course, a 10 screen, you know, you have this question of choreography um, and art articulation and the use of um, the sort of surveillance footage from the FBI, um, from the Freddie Gray uprisings, um, which we used in tandem with reversed fireworks um, to, if you like, um, images which have this sort of, if you like, surveilling aspect to them or panoptical view um, in relationship to movement. Um, for my mind, were the catalyst in terms of this sort of recapitulation of um, Douglas's um, 4th of July speech. Um, and in some ways, I think, goes to the heart of, um, you know, um, the kind of ways in which um, it would seem to me um, that we have so many of these um, sort of, you know, um, occasions where um, really that question of modernity um, and, if you like, um, citizen, citizenship, all of those aspects that Douglas was calling to question from the slave's position. And I think, you know, in a sense, that kind of slave philosophy, which was very much sort of part of the ways in which Douglas was trying to articulate his abolitionism, really still resonates so strongly, particularly um, if I think about the people who are in the um, Royal Academy audience, for example, Catherine Hall, um, who um, is a widow of Stuart Hall, and the work that she's been doing in terms of bringing to attention, in a sense, the question of um, the trajectory of, um, if you like, um, the economics of, of slavery, and um, the ways in which it sort of empowers, has empowered the capitals of the world um, and the trajectory and source of that. Um, her form of abolitionism has been to br bring to question um, the sort of ways in which sort of um, the economics, you know, are still part of the kind of legacy of power and control, um, which are hardly articulated, that we know so little about, um, which are at the center of the ways in which we conduct um, sort of everything um, is I think a very powerful way um, in which she's been pushing forward um, questions of abolition, abolitionism, um, you know, and of course, all the other questions follow, you know, um, Resistitution, um, repatriation, um, you know, you can see how they all connect to all the different um, questions which have come up so strongly, um, especially in, in this year, this critical year. Thank you. Should we return? I think so. Uh, here we are. <laughs> Instead of the blue sky of America, I'm covered with soft gray fog. <laughs> and this just talks around the question of transnationalism, which I know, you know, that Robin has been, and yourselves have been so critically involved in, you know, but with Douglas, he has this relationship to thinking about um, the transnational. And I know that's been so important in terms of the ways in which um, Scottish literature and writing um, was so central to changing of his thought and so this just leads us in relationship to those ideas um for this poster project from the foundation beautiful well um i know there's quite a lot to say now uh and thank you for pointing out the presence of catherine hall there as there were some others there in that audience that you might want to tell us about later but um also, uh, obviously, with the reference to Domino Sugar and the time compression in the video, I, I wonder, Robin, if you wanted to say something about your response to the to Lessons of the Hour, in particular, that clip. Oh, OK. Um, there's so much I want to respond to. I, <laughs> I mean, even before the clip, um, it's, it's such an amazing, amazing project. I mean, just to, to very quickly refer to the clip, if I can go back also to, to pictures. Um, 
but obviously domino sugar, you know, represents really the key commodity, you know, of the, the global slave trade and slave production in Baltimore, of course, uh, being the port city, one of the key port cities uh, in the history of, of global capital at that time. Um, and of course, Baltimore being the epicenter of the rebellion, you know, uh, in response to the, the killing of Freddie Gray in a city, incidentally, in which local government is black. You know, and I think that it's important to recognize again the way that an abolitionist politics, an abolitionist ethos, an abolitionist philosophy is one that attacks all forms of, you know, the reproduction of unfreedom, all forms of oppression at all times. Um, and I think again, Douglas's life, what he left behind, uh, and what he talked about, um, sort of speaks to that. But I, I kind of want to go back to two things, if you don't mind. One is Doug's speech about the Fourth of July, which is something that, um, you know, my, my my daughter sadly has heard, had been forced to listen to every Fourth of July <laughs> since since she was about three years old. Um, it's it's one of these iconic speeches that we just hold dear to us, and for and, and I think I want to just add one an additional thing to to what, what Isaac said so brilliantly, that for Douglas, that day was sacrosanct, not only for its hypocrisy, but it's the hypocrisy that post, po post the original 4th of July. This is, this is a man who actually believed that the Declaration of Independence could be the basis of making claims for freedom. This is someone who, again, you know, like, like so many, uh, when he made a change to adopt the Constitution, embrace the Constitution as an anti-slavery document in 1850, 51, by 1852, this is two years after the um, Fugitive Slave Act and the, the, the recognition that there's no such thing as a free Negro, basically, because every Black person was then um, surveilled, uh, subject to possibly re-enslavement, even, even if they've been free. Um, and so that moment when he presents that, he's saying, look, America has not lived up to the promise of the very declaration uh, of independence that had embedded in it this idea of natural rights for all human beings in recognition of Black people as, as human being. Um, and so it's a really interesting moment, his anger, um, his critique, his calling out the hypocrisy of the American state, which is, you know, I think important to recognize that because when, if we end up talking about John Brown, we're going to see a critique even of that position. Um, and just one other thing, just want to say about pictures. Um, I, I'm I'm so amazed and lifted by your decision to include excerpts of Douglas's speech, his lecture on pictures. Which and I just want to say something about this, and also the the fact that you mentioned Deb Willis. I mean, he gave that speech in Boston at the Tremont Temple, December third, eighteen sixty one. So Wednesday will be one hundred fifty nine years since he gave that speech, um, and he was thinking about the Civil War, which was, was just beginning, and the role that photography or the daguerreotypes might play in the Civil War. And what we know is that it played two really really critical roles. Um, one is in capturing and documenting death. I mean, something that people had not seen, dead bodies strewn all over the landscape. Um, but the other thing it did, and this is where Deb Willis and, and, um, and Barbara Krauthammer put out this book called Envisioning Emancipation. And, and some of those pictures are portraits mm -hmm. of men and women many men who served in the Union Army, black men, and their portraits and their these beautiful pictures where they have their, their weapons and they're in uniform and women are dressed up and whole families are together. That is what emancipation looks like. That's envisioning what an abolitionist reality could actually be. 
those pictures, I, I use those pictures in my class and I weep every time I show them because it is, it represents what Du Bois calls the moment in the sun where there was something close to a semblance of democracy that existed in the United States of America and was shut down. That moment is captured in those pictures in a way that, you know, Douglas kind of envisioned, he, he, he sort of imagined that ahead of time. And he even saw, I would argue, um, the power of the image before there was daguerreotypes. I mean, you think about uh, in his narrative, for example, how on the one hand, you're right, he's the most photographed person in America in the 19th century. But what is not photographed is something you capture in the film, the image of his back, mm. right? Remember that, I remember that, of course you don't remember that. <laughs> but I mean, the image of his back scarred, this is, this plays into this, you know, Deb's son, Hank Willis Thomas, this beautiful piece um, where he uses the image from Harper's. Um, it's a, 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 a man called named Gordon. His name is Gordon, right? And it's this horrific portrait of a shirtless man with his back mutilated. And it's, it was distributed as a, as a carte de uh, photo. And it became a kind of weapon in the repertoire of abolitionist agitrop, um, agitrop. And Harper's Weekly reproduced that image as an etching. And there was a triptych in Harper's, which started out with one image of him, uh, Gordon, sort of running away, escaping slavery, right? Um, and, and by the way, this, this uh, issue of Harper's uh, came out on the 4th of July, July um, 1863. So you have the image of Gordon with his running away, then the image of Gordon with his back, you know, um, you know called the scourge back. And then you have this third one in the triptych where, you know, he's not ragged, he's not barefoot, he's not a fugitive, but he is a Union soldier dressed up, standing with dignity. This is like the transformation uh, from slave to free, from uh, slave to citizen, you know, uh, from servitude to manhood, you know, and that third image of him in the Union uh, uh, uniform with gun in hand, looking all handsome, and he's described as intelligent, he's a fully realized human being. That is the potential, a different kind of representation. And by laying them out as a triptych, you see the transformation as a metaphor of what could be, you know? Um, and it's, you know, of course we could critique all the problems of militarism and violence or whatever, you know, but in that moment in 1863, this is sort of what uh, I think, you know, Douglas is envisioning as the power of the image. Because one, oh, and one last thing is that in his narrative, he has all these descriptions of his body, like so many slave narratives, the body becomes the evidence of the violence, the evidence of the crime. When he has that line, I forget how it goes, where he says, you know, I'm writing from a pen. Uh, he says, I have so many gashes on my feet from, uh, you know, from the ice uh, and crack from, from not having shoes basically that I could take the pen I'm writing with and stick it in the gashes of my feet. That's a, that's a visual image of the way his body sort of marks the violence of slavery. And yet the images we see of him are these dignified images that he has control over. You know, the portrait of that De Frederick Douglass. It's not the, he, he creates the portrait in the text, but then his body is photographed in such a way to represent like the bust that we see as we walk into, uh, in, in the film, as we walk into um, his sort of den. Anyway, that's, I'm saying a lot, sorry about that. But these are the kind of thoughts I've had, you know, thinking about uh, this, you know, remarkable work you've done and also thinking about what it means to kind of represent not just slavery, but to represent something that's imagined to be freedom. Exactly. Well, thank you for that. And especially for landing us on, on freedom and the ability to see 
for Douglas to also be attempting to give us all of that, um, even in the present. And of course, we're engaged in that same process now. And it takes me back, Isaac, to part of what you were saying about some of the images in that last clip, the Freddie Gray uh, photography and other things. And I just want to go back to that, that framework of thinking that the pictures will, will be able to communicate the, the story and the violence. Because part of what you've done in that short clip we, we saw was to connect from a time when there was this great belief that the pictures would convey the truth and the pictures were the truth to this time. And I wonder if you could tell people a little bit more about some of those images. I know you referenced them when we were on the small camera, but, and, and also about just that sense of, of how that shapes you as someone, as an artist, uh, this different relationship we have to the revelation of photography. Yes, no, I mean, it's a super interesting question. And I, you know, I just wanted to say, you know, um, I'd love to answer that question, but just to add a little bit to Robin's, um, you know, um, very eloquent kind of um, description that there's a way in which, you know, this question of um, the scar back, you know, was one which was so full of, tre you know, tribulations in the sense that um, when Kenneth Moore, the great, 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 great grandson of Frederick Douglass came to our studio in London, this was something, you know, that he said, straight away after he'd seen the work, you know, that, you know, this was an image, you know, that in some senses he, you know, had thought about, but, you know, it was a really incredibly moving sort of part of um, his visit at that particular moment. But I do think there's a way in which, um, you know, if we think about the question of um, the way in which um, sort of, if you like, if you like visual lynching <laughs> um, and the surveilling aspects, you know, of technologies and the role in which these technologies are being marshaled to capture and to mask movement. I think um, I'm, I'm, I, was, I was particularly struck by the kind of non-neutral role of technologies, the fact that they can be appropriated and are used, you know, against, you know, abolitionist movements against um, the rights of people in uprisings as a way to kind of control. Um, and what I was particularly struck by um, in a kind of more prophetic sense by the FBI footage for the Freddie Gray um, was the way in which these images are kind of almost in preparation, you know, for war, you know, um, you know, the images um, which are being conducted um, in terms of a way in which, you know, bombings and that kind of, if you like, imaging um, of a public, of citizens. Um, and so I was particularly struck by that. And I think this kind of way in which, um, you know, technology and, and the non-neutral aspect of it you know, was something that um, Douglas was aware of. And I think that's precisely, you know, why when he was photographed, there's always a kind of blank screen behind him. There are, uh, there are no pictorial arrangements as such. You know, there's just this way in which he wants to rearticulate and use um, his body, you know, and portrait as a form of resistance, you know, against the kind of brutality and violence, which was writ large of course, at the time. Um, and I think, you know, that, um, you know, this has been the compelling part in one's own work of trying to, you know, if you like, use that non-neutral non aspect of technologies um, and to rearticulate them, you know, for the possibility to imagine freedom, but at the same time to reject the images of abjection, you know, which are so part of the ways in which if you like the dominant media um, frame, um, you know, injustices, you know, um, how can we form an image of liberation and resistance, um, so to speak? And so, I mean, this is, you know, one of the quests in relationship to trying to shift away, if you like, just from images of violence. And at the same time, um, to 
well, you know, their, their inevitability, if you like. So and I think it's precisely his use of language, you know, where we find this sort of core resistance. I think you're muted, Robin, but um, yes, this resistance that you're talking about and this counter reading and counter appropriation, which of course was Douglas's, but also growing from uh, a collectivity. And I guess one of the things that I would love to hear a little bit more from both of you about is just the relationship, especially now in, in representing Douglas in artwork, but also in popular culture, we're seeing the, the explosion of other kinds of representations about this period. Uh, and thinking about uh, what it means to um, be reading genealogically, uh, engaging with history as a history of the present, understanding that at all moments there are these possibilities for counter reading, and yet they are produced in, in collectives. Um, and so, you know, how, what is the kind of tension we have between this image of the great man? And of course you put, uh, I love how um, Anna Marie Douglas is also almost larger than and Frederick it, it behind you. So she's, she's now emerged, but of course that's so rare. Uh, and that's so much of a, of a statement that you're making by doing that. So I, I'd love to hear a little bit more about, about that, the relationship between that. And I guess iconography is part of what the question I'm asking as well. So who goes first? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So so um, and and here you think thinking about the way that Douglas continues to be re-represented, right? Is that what you're? Yes. Doing? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No. Um, it's it's a really it's it's such a it's a question I've been thinking about since our our first conversation, um, and. It's interesting because, you know, you think about even the title of Lessons of the Hour, um, there's always Douglas for the, of the Hour. And Douglas of the Hour in the 1960s, for example, um, was a very different Douglas from the, the 1980s and 90s. Uh, and I think about, you know, just the role that, um, that well, Angela played in basically elevating Douglas from you know being simply the narrator of his story to being a philosopher of you know 19th century kind of liberalism and a critique of liberalism i mean it's it really changed a lot um, in terms of of the development of black studies for example and douglas's role as as thinker and as you move into you know douglas you know um like today i know we talked about this um, the, the 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 representation of Douglas in uh, in that uh, new show, um, uh, which You're Lord Bird, Lord Bird, right? Lord right. Bird, yes, Lord Bird. Which um, which I only saw one episode, and after that, I didn't really feel like I needed to see more of it. I, I know some people love it. Some people love the fact that this is an image of Douglas that is. Um, very, you know, iconoclastic and and very rebellious in many ways. But he's, but I just never thought I'd imagine a Douglas who is uh, represented as, you know, uh, like an out like a polygamous womanizer who is more concerned about his image than about struggle. Whereas I I come back from you know seeing lessons of the hour as seeing the image as struggle, the struggle for image as part of struggle. And, you know, part of this, what disturbed me too was the representation of John Brown. Mm -hmm. And something you said about um, how we do these things in collective. Um, this is a problem with, I think, all of the scholarship around Douglas for the, for the most part, is that there's a way in which he is separated from the collective. Mm -hmm. he's, he's taken out. Um, not always, uh, you know, certainly, you know, in a lot of the, the sort of new texts see him as a singular figure. And that's partly probably because he saw himself as a singular, singular figure. But when you look at his history, 
he was in movements. His relationship to Ida B. Wells, his relationship uh, to, um, to John Brown, to Martin Delaney, to others, his disagreements, uh, his role in terms of shaping the direction of the Garrisonians. Um, you know, th th there, may, there may be a critique to be had about uh, Douglass's relationship to mass movements. Certainly his son's relationship to the union movement is, is also something really important to look at. And maybe there is a separation that we have to attend to because if we then take that image of Douglas and then think about what does contemporary abolition looks like, it is something that's insistently collective, insistently thinking uh, together, insistently thinking of those in forms of unfreedom to think with those who have a different relationship to unfreedom. Um, to talk about like, you know, where, where, does, where does critique come from? Um, so in prison abolition, it's the imprison that produces critiques of the carceral state, you know, without having any particular pedigree, right? So this idea of collective, collective organizing, collective thinking is something that we don't always associate with, with Douglas, you know, um, and maybe there's reasons for that, but if we, end up talking about it at some point, it's probably worth talking about, you know, um, the communities that he made, he created, especially in the, 19, in the 1850s, uh, that really was pushing toward trying to, to foment civil war. You know, people like Delaney and Brown uh, and Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth and people like that as a community, as opposed to as a set of individuals. Yeah, no, I was very struck by um, this sort of popular, if you like, um, representation of um, Douglas um, in the kind of Brown sort of series. And uh, I thought, I mean, why this anxiety and why this sort of um, resort to the comedic, you know, with Douglas, you know, and um, I think it's particularly striking um, that this question of um, the community of friends um, that he was a part of, um, which is one which I've tried to kind of connect in the book, um, in terms of IDB Wells. There isn't IDB Wells in the audience. Um, there is, you know, um, you know, all the sort of abolitionists, um, you know, Ottilin Assin um, and, you know, the suffragette movement Leaders, they're all there in that audience, mixed with Catherine Hoare, mixed with sort of um, other artists and, in a way, um, activists. Um, that question of activism, I think, is so important in terms of trying to correlate the image and to um, bring forward this sort of, as you say, um, you know, community um, which Douglas was part of, which is resisted, of course, to a certain extent. And I think, it, yeah, I mean, I think that sort of consciousness is so important in terms of trying to make him signify, um, you know, with um, the, the relationship today in the in the in the contemporaneous sense, you know. And um, and I've I've literally come out of a class. Um, with a brilliant student who gave an amazing presentation on critical resistance. You know, he's working on the archive of critical resistance. And um, I just saw, you know, within his presentation, um, this amazing trajectory between the work of critical resistance, you know, and the historical legacy, you know, if we go to Douglas, you know, that continues in that kind of um, work today. Um, you know, around prisons and um, um, around economic justice, um, you know, ways to imagine freedom, all of those kind of um, collective um, groups, you know, which are so pivotal and so important. And, um, and I'm very struck by, um, you know, um, what he said, um, and also what Andrew said about the idea that you know, these moments come into fruition as, as, they as they have done in 2020, you know, but then we see, the, you know, and that long, if you like, work that needs to take place in relationship to activism and thinking about these questions. Um, and of course, the way in which they have proliferated um, in 
these contemporary art forms, but in connection to these critical questions we're examining. Well, thank you. And it's great to be reminded of the early critical resistance days. And, and for our audience, maybe it's important to also just talk a little bit about this because it brings me back to this question of how we have a community prepared to make different interpretations, right? So how we get to, and this is what you were doing when you were quoting, I'll say Angela Davis, um, when you were quoting Angela Davis and you were saying that um, we are, you know, this moment looks as if, right, post George Floyd, it looks as if it's come from nowhere. But of course, we always know that the reason why people can have a different interpretation, right, this moment is different from Rodney King, is really about all the work that's been go going on. And, and a lot of that work is visual. People have been deeply engaged in our visual culture and in re-understanding our histories. But it also brings me back to something that emerged earlier on in our conversation about the relationship to, um, to thinking about the analogy to slavery. So back again to this moment, this historical moment for Douglas, and then now the historical moment of sort of critical resistance and into our contemporary abolition mo uh, movement. And one of the things that we wrote about in the in the catalog or the um, program for the critical resistance conference, which I, I've forgotten about, I should go back and, and look at it again. But I remember thinking very much about how to write about whether or not this was a kind of um, the same as and could be built on the past or, and sort of thinking about how it could be the past. And also, I think it's important for people to, to pull out what, what Robin has just said, that, that critical resistance was named that precisely to make sure to infuse this work and people's sense of this work with intellectual contributions, with art, with music, uh, it was so much a part of the way of talking and thinking about and making decisions about everything that could and would happen. And so your work, Isaac, really allows me to return very closely to that feeling of how we would get people to understand, not that we could make abolition in the contemporary moment happen in the same exact way, but that if we looked very deeply at that, that older abolitionist movement, and thought about the residues of slavery in the present and learn to read for those and learn to read for freedom, that we would be actually in an, a place where we could move on and, and make the struggle um, make a difference. So I wanna thank you for, for allowing us to return to this. And there are some questions coming in and I'm, I'm just gonna go to a couple of them, although I know that you two probably have so much more you wanna say to each other. Um, some of them will allow us, I think, to pick on to pick up on things we've already talked about. Um, one is pretty simple from Mark, which says, "What would you like us to understand about the role of women in Douglas's life?" And I think it's actually a question for you, Isaac. So we'll send it to you first. But I think Robin, you might have something to say about that as well after. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think there's, you know, I mean, I think behind, you know, Douglas and behind his image. Um, Anna Murray Douglas, um, you know, his wife was really pivotal um, in the kind of sartorial presentation of Douglas, you know, um, and in the work, there's a part where we have these two modernities of the train and the movement of the train and the kind of sewing machine. And they, we purposely interjected these two apparatus um, of modernity at that particular moment in the film to cast that question, you know, that there's a labor behind Douglas's image, you know, and this labor, um, this woman's labor, um, his wife's labor is precisely that which makes the possibility for Douglas to reimagine his self image. Um, but I think apart from that, I mean, of course, there are all these conversations um, between the suffragette, um, Susan B. Anthony, um, and that historical legacy and the role that he played in the suffragette movement, the fact, you know, that he, you know, the last speech he gave was in such a meeting before his death, um, you know, so the commitment that he had, even though it was ambivalent um, to some extent in relationship to when it came to votes, um, black men versus women, 
you know, um, I think there's a way in which the, it, it's incredibly important. Otti Asin, who translated his work into German, um, you know, it seems to me that he saw the question of transnationalism, um, the abolitionist work that he did in Scotland, ship to um, Quakerism, um, the way that he observed um, Quakerism, appreciation of landscapes, of silence, all of those things which he took on himself, the relationship to Scottish literature um, and um, the, the way in which the both the suffragette movement and Quaker movement and the women who actually paid for his freedom, um, you know, I mean, all of those conordiates, I think, are so important, you know, and there's a way in which I would say that, um, I mean, these things are part of, um, I'm hoping, the kind of visual um, sort of indexical markers of the work um, in, in, in the piece. Can you just say one more thing about that? That is, you know, where the Scottish women are singing, send back the money. Yes. So talk, talk, say for those who may not have seen it, just could you say more about that, that sending back the money to pay for his? Yeah, I mean, there's a, what is that? The Scottish, um, you know, lullaby or, you know, where, you know, send back the money was a campaign where the free the church, um, the, um, the free church movement in Scotland was receiving money from slavery and at the same time involved in abolitionism and Douglas waged a campaign um, with his colleagues um, to have that money be returned. Mm -hmm. um, and it was precisely this ballad um, which appears in this film, um, which we found archivally and is sung even today, that Douglas is part of this sort of ballad, um, this popular ballad um, of to send back the money. And, you know, you could say that that's a whole trajectory now from, you know, now send back the money, send back the, the you know, the sculpture, the African sculptures, the downing of monuments. I mean, it's all about this reverse movement um, and Douglas was calling for that. And so, um, and, you know, of course, this is sung by women, you know, women who were also very centrally involved in his returning back to Scotland, no longer fugitive slave. Um, so, um, yeah, so I think. Can I just, um, it's a little tag on to this um, because I just, I keep looking at Anna Marie Douglas behind you. I can't help it. I know it's not her, but it, it's her in, in your representation. And um, I'm just thinking about Blight's, David Blight's uh, biography and how she's represented there versus how she is in Lessons of the Hour. And of course, you just gave us a beautiful example of how you take those two technologies to help to create a conversation that we wouldn't necessarily have if we just read the biography, right? And the details about her. And I don't think he's trying to um, make her look unimportant, but the way that he characterizes her as not literate, not able really to become, literate, you know, all these ways that she's, sort of um, not quite, um, and yet you've really turned her into something else. And I wonder if Robin, you might kind of pick up on that a little bit, say more about the, the biographical work that's been done. Oh, okay. Um, or anything else you feel? Well, with, without making people mad? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Well, you can um, do that. Abolition no, no, I, spirit. <laughs> I, I, see, I think you said it all. I think that um, there is a way in which, um, Anna Douglas doesn't, Anna Marie, Marie Douglas doesn't really figure. And there's, there's a way with people kind of come away thinking, well, it's because she doesn't figure in or, or match Douglas's intellect that he ends up remarrying. Right. Uh, and it's a very problematic representation. So I, I really love the fact that she's so central both in the film and, you know, the connection of the two technologies, but also she's a very important subject in terms of representation. It's, it's her image that is, it's, it's, you, see, you see her posing for a picture, uh, even more so than Douglas. Um, you walk into uh, 
this empty room in the house and what you see are musical instruments. You know, you see the piano and the violin, you see a, a, a domestic space that clearly she's responsible for. Um, and, you know, despite the fact that Douglas himself as a, a supporter of, of women's suffrage wasn't always the, the most um, generous when it came to like how he ran his household, very patriarchal. Um, so I think it's very important that, to have her in there as a, as a major figure. But then when you pull the camera back and you think about all the black women in 19th century abolitionist struggles, I mean, they could, they could be described exactly the way David Blight describes them. You know, they may, they may not have formal literacy, but they had a deep knowledge and passion for freedom. You know, they may, they may have other kinds of skills, you know, and I think that, that by centering her in the story is to then center all the black women you know, who have played these critical roles, but always been behind the scenes. You know, you think about um, as we even move into the 20th century, where they were talking about Baltimore and the uprising, where they were talking about, you know, other kinds of the anti-lynching movement, for example, who's at the forefront of anti-lynching? It's women's, black women's organizations, you know, not just Ida B. Wells, but all the women who were involved you know, through the work of the Y and other organizations. So imagine like what a different narrative of, of sort of 19th and 20th century American history would look like had a figure like, you know, Anna Murray uh, Douglas been the central figure of the story. Uh, it would be much more representative of the way movements actually work and operate. And then we'd have to be forced to go back to this other question of what does it mean to build movements in collective? You know, and again, critical resistance is an example of his moratorium project, um, the anti-racist movements emerging out of Ferguson, out of Baltimore. These were often women led, queer led, you know, and, and where you had a participation that did not look like the charismatic leader, right? Yes. Well, we are actually almost out of time. Um, we have a few more special things. We're going to have our video uh, from Nic Nicholas Payton. But before we do that, I just want to maybe close with um, allowing you to reflect through a question that came in about what has been discussed is the question of justice, is justice and images. Uh, and this is the question that came in from Khadija. In thinking about the power of owning one's image, and the current social media machine where people spread images of black death like clockwork, how do we as abolitionists walk the line between awareness and exploitation? And does that distinction matter? And I'll, I'll let you sit with this for a moment, but um, just to kind of meditate on it and think about what closing words you might want to add from today. Uh, also just thinking about this question of how we would have um, a factual, authentic, accurate image, for example, since we're talking about Anna Murray Douglas, right, without um, being able to be able to reinterpret. And so I'm really looking at what's behind you, Isaac, as the great, a great example of the role of art and allowing us to know differently. And so our relationship to history can be transformed and our ability to select differently the images that we take up um, can operate in a new way. Mm -hmm. And so I just wonder if you wanted to close with any comments or a reference to the question that came in about the way uh, our social media uh, operates with images and, and our care. Yeah, I, mean, I think, um, you know, it's a really pivotal question and it's one that I thought a lot about because I think there's a way in which, if you like, images of abjection um, you know, um, death. I mean, they have always been images um, that hold a certain fascination. Um, and in our social media culture, um, in a contemporaneous sense, there's a way in which, you know, they are the kind of lifeblood, you know, in this very deathly scenario um, where, if you like, um, they come to be seen as naturalized images mm -hmm. um, that we would somehow almost take for granted as, um, yeah, that, you know, black lives 
in that sense, um, and the signification of them um, is one which, of course, people have tried to call into question. Of course, we know that um, the mobilization of such an image perhaps was partly one of the images which resulted in our election result in an unconscious sense. You know, um, the price of um, being able to um, have, you know, the possibility of change, um, I think it's probably too much of a burden, someone in relationship to the weight that these images signify. But what then would be the images that one might want to um, contest those narratives somehow? So I think there's always going to be, um, without sounding utopian, you know, those other images which create community, which create resistance, which you know, are the songs um, of how we live. You know, I think, you know, um, we know that it's always, there's always been another trajectory for the possibility um, for sustaining one and generations in the future. And I think, you know, we know that those images, you know, are, are not enough, you know, so. And that's why I tried to make works, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and we thank you for that for the work because it does inspire us and move us forward. You know, this is such a hard question, and I hope that um, Gina, you can uh, give the last answer by talking about, um, you know, the struggles that you describe about like what should the image for critical resistance conference look like, the first one you know, the kinds of debates that people are having about what, what's really representative politically. And, and I don't wanna answer the question, but I do wanna pose uh, a set of questions. And that is, why is it, uh, you know, what, what, what's appealing about those images of, of, of black death that circulate, you know? In other words, um, what we've witnessed, and I'm old enough to remember this, and it's it's interesting because you know, um, I go back to Black popular culture, you know, a book that you know that that you um, edited, Gina, and that Isaac is you know a, a prominent figure in, and in that book, part of the question was like, how do you, you know what what is the proper representations of blackness, and there's there's one school of thought that says you know we have spent too much time time on resistance and resilience and we need to really get to the heart the blood the violence of anti-black racism and slavery and, and lynching that this is what we need to actually deal with and we need to put it up front the other one is we've been too soft pedaled on positive images and so we need to kind of challenge the idea of of positive versus negative and break that dyad and produce something that's more um uh that, that creates more aggravation in some ways in terms of the, the dominant narrative. And then, you know, something that's not respectable. We've been pushing against respectability politics, which sometimes plays itself out in ways that um, are really problematic, you know, which we could talk about in another conversation. But the final thing is, I, I really want to know, you know, what, what is the opposition to the to the kind of image of of struggle and in, in, in opposition as a kind of dominant image, I've heard it said by some people who I won't name that you know part of what we do is we write and represent struggle porn. Struggle porn is the term that's circulating that means too much resistance and opposition, uh, too much celebration of resilience um, and not enough of loss and death and destruction and violence and in the fact that this particular world we live in will never change. Um, so to me it's that it's in that tension that we have to kind of figure out an answer as opposed to um, being able to just transcend it. But you all did something with critical resistance I would love for you to talk about which I thought was pretty astounding. 
Well, I would, um, except we're, we're out of time. I will say that for those who are interested, our website, barringfreedom.org, has a record of all our previous conversations. And I'm fairly certain that Angela Davis told that story in our when we had an exchange in our first one. So we can find it there. Part of the story of it was really the search for an image that wasn't just bars. Um, so what does it mean when you're an abolitionist to search for an image that represents the truth of incarceration, right? And so for most people that without a sophisticated conversation about how visual culture operates and without an artist's sensibility, it can often just be a kind of obvious thing. Let's just show what's happening. But for, for Rachel and for me, this entire series is really about saying it's never that simple. And we need artists, we rely on artists to help us to cultivate our ways of seeing, to help us to cultivate critique. And of course, for the rest of us scholars and others who are immersed in this history, it's important for us to know that as we're in class after class describing slavery and talking about details, sometimes we will have the students who will break down and I forget because I relate to this material in a very different way, having taught it for so long and read about it for so long and looked at these images for so long. So I really try to operate with an abundance of care about the selection and I rely on fictional works and works by visual artists in order to help to translate these questions and to give them a more philosophical frame and also to give them a more liberatory frame because otherwise it's not possible for us to do this. And this is the uh, capacity we want to uh, create in everyone who in engages with us in this series. And it's one of the reasons why so many generous musicians have been dedicating their time to making special music for us and videos for us. And so I'm now going to trans uh, transition to our closing. Uh, and I want to thank both of you for a wonderful conversation that really begins like feels like just the beginning. I feel like we could just keep keep doing this. Uh, and I know we, we probably will. Um, but I want to thank you and also uh, let us all enjoy together uh, this video, which comes to us from Nicholas Payton, an amazing uh, musician who um, who sent us a video called Freedom is No Fear. And this is what he writes about it. As a black American, when I think about abolition, my mind immediately goes to music as being the first means of crafting our liberation post-colonization. When we were not allowed to speak our native tongues, we created a new language in the blues. In this piece, we use sound and visuals as a means of recalling a lineage in which our traumas are not commodified for entertainment or media fodder. We use repetition to help break through the mental fog of false constructs like racism and sexism. Throughout the composition, our ancestor Nina Simone is heard reminding us that freedom is no fear. To me, abolition is more than just visualizing a future in which we are free, but that freedom is now and it starts in the mind. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nicholas Payton. Here is Freedom is No Fear. Everybody is half dead. Everybody avoids everybody. All over the place, in most situations, most all of the time. I know I'm one of those everybody. And to me, it is terrible. And so all I'm trying to do all the time is just to open people up so they can feel themselves and let themselves be open to somebody else. That is all. That's it. Everybody is half dead. Everybody avoids everybody. All over the place, in most situations, most all of the time. I know I'm one of those everybody. And to me, it is terrible. And so all I'm trying to do all the time is just to open people up so they can feel themselves and let themselves be open to somebody else. That is all. That's it. Tell you what freedom is to me, no fear. And that's something else. I'll tell I'm you what freedom of, is to uh, me, no fear. Nope. And I want to kind of focus on these people who. I'll tell you what 
tell you what freedom is to me. No fear. And that's I'll tell you what freedom is to me. No fear. And that's I'll tell you what freedom is to me. No fear. Freedom is to me, no fear. And that's a 
like, like, I'll tell you what freedom is to me. No fear. I mean, really, no fear. If I, if I could have that half of my life, no fear. Lots of children have no fear. That's the closest way, that's the only way I can describe it. That's not all of it. But it is something to really, really feel. It's like a new way of seeing. A new way of seeing. Have you, have you, like, I know. It's like a new way of seeing. A new way of seeing.